Hi, I'm Ed Jager, chair of the subrogation group at White & Williams. Welcome to Subro Sessions. Today's episode is called Spoliation, often argued, rarely understood. Matt Ferry, Gus Sara, and Leon Scaff are together again to discuss and debate three different spoliation hypotheticals. Hello, everyone. Welcome again to Subro Sessions. Today's episode is titled uh, Spoliation, Often Argued, Rarely Understood. My name is Gus Sara, and I'm here with my esteemed hosts, Matt Ferry and Leon Scaff. Hi, everyone. Great to be back with our loyal and enthusiastic listeners. I'm Matt Ferry with the White and Williams Subrogation Department. Hey, everyone. I'm Leon Scaff. I'm a uh, counsel in the Subrogation Department of White and Williams. Uh, before we get into spoliation, the big other news in our department is that Gus is rejoining our fantasy football league. So sooner or later, he'll probably have a fantasy football podcast out, I imagine. It's actually great news for everyone else in the league. You would think that no one could possibly go 14 weeks without winning a game. Gus proved you wrong. Thank you very much for that, guys. Hopefully, I'll redeem myself and not be last place again. On to spoliation. Uh, the potential issues created by spoliation are the stuff of nightmares for subrogation professionals. There are so many ways that evidence spoliation issues can arise. Sometimes spoliation is unavoidable and it's often not your side's fault, but spoliation of evidence can stop a case in its tracks before it even gets going. Or even worse, ruin a case that's well into litigation. In the field of subrogation, spoliation of evidence is unfortunately always relevant. From the day the loss occurs all the way through resolution. From the moment you get notice of a loss to the process of preserving the evidence, through the evidence examination, and even after you settle your claim, the risk of spoliation exists. We're going to be discussing some hypotheticals today that are based on either one of our experiences or stories that we've heard along our subrogation journeys. Obviously, we can't touch on every issue on spoliation, which would be an endless podcast, but we're just going to hit on some issues that we think are important and was worth mentioning on the first episode on spoliation. For each of these hypotheticals we're going to be discussing, uh, one of us will provide our perspectives on how we would handle that particular situation. So we're going to move right into hypothetical number one, and that's going to be proposed by Matt. Okay, hypothetical number one is addressed to Gus. Gus, a subrogation attorney, is at a joint evidence exam, and he sees that a few of the experts are struggling to get a large piece of evidence onto the evidence table. He is considering helping. What's your reaction to that? All right. Lots of thoughts come to mind. It's understandable that an attorney wants to fit in as one of the group and have a good rapport with the experts, because that certainly helps down the road if you need uh, to have a frank discussion with the experts. And if they feel like you're one of the bunch, they may be more inclined to share some information with you. So it's always intuitive that wanting to lend a helping hand when you see someone struggling you want to follow that intuition. Not to mention sometimes the unwrapping and moving of evidence can be a very slow and tedious process. And we want to move on to subrogating other cases. So we feel inclined to st step up and help the process. However, I think, my opinion, it is imperative that attorneys refrain from handling evidence. There is simply just no justifiable reason for an attorney to ever touch or hold evidence especially if the evidence is fragile. When an attorney handles evidence, the attorney is now creating potential liability exposure for that attorney or the firm. If an attorney inadvertently modifies or destroys the evidence, that attorney may be held responsible. In addition, uh, to make matters worse, if an attorney modifies the evidence, the attorney then becomes a critical fact witness in the case and is thus conflicted out of representing the client. There is simply no conceivable benefit that outweighs these potential risks. So I would say that an attorney attending an evidence exam, which is something that we often do as subrogation professionals, uh, should always refrain from handling evidence. I've heard stories of uh, attorneys having evidence shipped to their office. I would also advise against that. 
because then you're a part of the chain of custody and again, could end up being a fact witness at some point. I think that this line of reasoning can also extend to subrogation uh, adjusters or first party adjusters or anybody that's representing the carrier at an inspection that's not actually the expert themselves. Yeah, that fact witness issue was something that I had heard. Um, I don't know if you guys have too, that actually did happen to a younger associate who who <laughs> dropped something and then literally became a fact witness in the case. I don't know if that's true or not, but it certainly uh, scared me not to do it. And, you know, even someone like Matt who wants to show off his muscles, you got to kind of take a step back. You know, it reminds me when I was a uh, when I was assistant DA coming out of law school. It was actually beaten into my head by older assistant DAs that you cannot become a witness in your own case. And as subrogation attorneys, you know, often we want to be assertive, we want to be aggressive, we want to be hands on, both literally and figuratively. Bottom line, in most cases, it is not a good idea to be hands on, at least literally, as a subrogation attorney. You do not want to be a witness in your own case if you think additional investigation should be done, if you think evidence handling should be done. It should be done by the person you can put on the witness stand who can describe what they saw, what they did, what they heard, and from whom. So in with rare exceptions, stay hands off as a segregation attorney. Hypothetical number two for Matt. Your fire investigator calls you from the scene during his initial site inspection and tells you that the fire started at a furnace closet adjacent to a bedroom because the exhaust vent for the furnace was too close to the closet door. In the course of telling you his preliminary theory, he tells you that he knows the fire didn't start in the bedroom because he took all of the bedroom debris outside the home and found nothing that could be considered to be the remains of an ignition source. Your response. All right. I, I, I really wish that this was just a hypothetical. Unfortunately, that hits very close to home. And this is extremely similar to a case I actually did have. The one difference being when I spoke with the expert on the phone, he did not tell me that he moved the evidence, he moved the debris outside the home to look through it. The life lesson to be learned here is if your expert moved any fire debris as part of his initial investigation, you need to ask where he moved it from and where he left it. The fact that my expert moved some fire debris in his initial site inspection in and of itself is generally not going to be a concern to me. For the most part, our experts have to move fire debris at an at a, uh, initial site inspection because oftentimes the fire department actually takes the fire debris from the home and puts it in the yard. Our expert will typically have to move fire debris back inside the home really for two reasons. One, to try to make sure that it's not going to disappear or you know, otherwise be taken. And two, so he can try to recreate where everything was in the room of origin to try to figure out where and how the fire started. Additionally, some level of delayering of fire debris inside the home is typically going to be necessary to try to determine the area of origin and potential ignition sources so we know what parties to place on notice. However, I think it's important to remember that the general understanding that I think most people have of evidence spoliation isn't broad enough. I, I think the general understanding of evidence spoliation for most people is that the subrogated carrier or the insured or someone who has been retained by the subrogated carrier or the insured disposes of physical evidence that represents a potential cause of the fire. We need to go a step further in terms of our understanding of spoliation and how we communicate to our experts about what spoliation actually is. Because a reasonable spoliation claim can be developed by an adverse party if our expert simply creates a situation where it is more likely that fire debris from a relevant area of the home will disappear after our investigator leaves the scene. So the situation I had, again, very similar to the hypothetical itself, this was a, a one-story home and the fire started in a furnace closet that was adjacent to a bedroom, also on the first floor of the home. The bedroom faced the front of the home. It had more or less a floor-to-wall, a floor-to-ceiling uh, window that was blown out during the fire. What our expert had done was he had taken the fire debris out of the bedroom, literally placed it outside the home through this large, now open front window, and he looked through it for any possible relevant you know, components in this fire debris. The bedroom in question belonged to the insured's daughter. The expert had received information that she had a Dell computer in the bedroom. He could not find anything in that fire debris that he thought could be a component of any possible ignition source, including a Dell computer. So my expert indicated that he had looked through the fire debris in the bedroom. He did not tell me that he had taken it outside the home and left it outside the home. I didn't think to ask. He didn't mention it. So I sent my notice letter to the furnace installer. 
when everyone arrived for the joint site inspection, we learned that the trash collection company had come along and taken this fire debris that our expert had placed in front of the home. And I asked the expert on the phone, I said, what was the reaction of the adverse expert to discovering this evidence wasn't there? And he had said, well, he's, he's pretty satisfied that his client, his carrier has a great spoliation claim. Uh, my expert was, was kind of angry about that. He was thinking that we had done nothing wrong. You know, we had not disposed of this evidence. We had not asked anyone to dispose of this evidence. And part of me, at least initially, sort of agreed with them. It, it's not what you think of when you think of spoliation. We did not personally dispose of it. We did not want it to be disposed. We did not authorize that it be disposed. And also, what was disposed is, some, is debris that we had determined had no relevant debris in it. So, you know, not necessarily what you think of when you think of spoliation. But the more I talked about it with colleagues, I looked at some case law, and this was about 10 years ago. And I realized that it, it really is, it at least lays the foundation for what could be a, a viable spoliation claim by the target. And you have, to, you have to try to think of things from their perspective, because we create a situation where evidence with, with debris was more likely to disappear after we left the scene than it was before our expert had gotten to the scene. And as far as our point of view, that there was nothing relevant in that debris, well, we would basically be telling this party, hey, listen, we think you're at fault and don't worry about that debris you couldn't get a, get a look at. We checked it out. It wouldn't have helped you. It's not the most reasonable position. It's not the position that you want to be advocating. And un unfortunately, you know, it, it put us in a tough spot in that case. An interesting footnote about that case, when it came time for my expert's deposition and I was prepping him, I said, look, I, I know how you and I initially felt about this evidence being taken away or this debris being taken away. Uh, honestly, we have to own this mistake. You know, when you're questioned, just say, look, I'm sorry, it was a mistake. Uh, I did not think the evidence was going to be, the, the debris was going to be taken away. I did not want it to be taken away. But at the same time, that was not, there was nothing relevant in that debris. I go where the evidence takes me. If there was any relevant components in that debris, I would have retained them. And there were no relevant components in that debris. I was hoping that's how the deposition would have gone. What ultimately wound up happening my expert, when he started being questioned about that, started talking about the standard of care of a trash collector and how he thinks it was violated and how he knows the standard of care of a trash collector because he has had his trash taken away from his home for 40 years. So it really just went downhill from there. It wasn't a great situation to be in. We didn't handle it great. And honestly, the, the lesson to be learned is if when you're speaking with your expert on the phone about his initial site inspection, if he moved any fire debris, Ask him where he moved it from, ask him where he moved it to, ask him where he left it. We do not want to be in a situation where we have made debris from a relevant area of the home more likely to disappear than it was prior to our going to the scene. All right. So now moving on to hypothetical three, and this one is for Leon. You have a water loss that appears to start at a filter. You send notice letters to the installer and manufacturer and set a date for the joint site inspection which is 20 days after the letters were sent. Representatives of the installer attended the inspection, but no one from the manufacturer showed up. Experts for the installer want to proceed. How do you propose proceeding? Okay, this is one that's a tricky situation and something that kind of happens more often than we like. I mean, the realistic and maybe somewhat unsatisfying answer is that it kind of depends on the circumstances of the loss. So in this case, it's, I look at it like a step-by-step -step analysis. So the first thing an attorney wants to be sure of is that in this case, the manufacturer actually received the notice letter. We send out so many notice letters and through so many different means, FedEx, fax, email, however it is, we can't always be sure that they actually got it unless we get proof. You know, proof of mailing at a corporate address may be sufficient for a court if you're in litigation, but, you know, avoiding more pragmatic concerns and pre-suit investigation sometimes takes a little bit more. So I want confirmation from the manufacturer themselves that they received the letter. You know, sometimes that's easier said than done. If you hear back from their carrier or even them, then obviously you know they received it. Otherwise, it probably requires a few phone calls before, you know, you even get to the inspection to say, hey, did you get this? Did you send it to your carrier? Confirm with someone. So once you confirm receipt of the notice letter, your next move should really depend on the response of the manufacturer or the carrier. So if they told you they want to be at the inspection, but for some reasonable reason, like a, a flight delay, an illness, my dog at the homework, whatever, they didn't make it, I would strongly consider rescheduling the inspection. Because, you know, any court's going to say, 
look, you know, you had extra time to do it. You could have rescheduled it. They had a reasonable response. That's typical grounds for spoliation. Now, sometimes it's not possible because, you know, your insured needs to mitigate. The carrier needs to make a business decision. But in most cases, you know, you can get an extra week or so if you really need it. Even if the excuse is not reasonable, they forgot that, you know, what day it was, they went to the wrong address or whatever it is, I'd still consider rescheduling. If it's not really going to rock the boat too much with the insured, you know, if the insured is going to be out for months anyway, and an extra week is not, you know, going to cause too much problems, then then reschedule it, give them another shot so that one day if they're crying spoliation, you can really lay it out how you went the extra mile to make sure that this party was, you know, going to be able to see the scene. Now, if the carrier or the manufacturer tells you they don't want to attend, that's a whole different story. You know, I'm not going to let them thwart our investigation when they don't even want to be a part of it. So unless there's some other reason for their position, like they want to put another party on notice, which is obviously reasonable and probably in yours and everyone else's best interest, or they don't like the protocol that your expert sent, or they have some additional information they want to gather first, then I would move forward. However, I would do my best to get their position about not wanting to attend, about being fine with releasing the scene without them in writing so that they can come back to get you later. Well, after three hypotheticals, we think it's time to wrap this up. And in conclusion, I say this, the risk of spoliation can be daunting and sometimes frightening. The best way of making sure you never become the subject of a spoliation folktale is to be methodical and spend time on these concerns early on. Doing so may just prevent a nightmare later. Okay, I'll just add that, you know, keep in mind that to a large extent, avoiding potential spoliation is more a means to making everyone feel like they have had an opportunity at a fair and open investigation than anything else. Now, ensuring that the adverse experts are satisfied leads to liability adjusters being satisfied. This is in everyone's favor, including yours, when you ultimately make your demand. Till next time, take care. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for listening to Subro Sessions. Stay tuned for more episodes from the Subrogation Group at White and & Williams and visit whiteandwilliams.com to learn more about the firm, our group, and this podcast.